Downton Abbey's last season is set to premiere next January, and it's been fun to see how the Crawley family has navigated the changes in society from 1912 through the 1920s. Perhaps the biggest transformations have been with the aristocratic women on the program. We see Lady Sybil becoming a nurse during World War I, Lady Edith driving a tractor and heading up a publishing company, Lady Mary taking a very active role in the running of the Downton estate, and Cousin Rose frequenting jazz clubs and dating a black singer. In their day, these fictional women would be known in all of the elite social circles, and their behavior scrutinized, gossiped about, and remembered to this day. There are many women, however, who took non-traditional paths, and few, if any of us, even know their names. Our guests discuss two very different women, one a socialite and the other a bandit, and show how these ladies lived their unconventional lives and made their marks despite social disapproval. Emily Bingham's great-aunt Henrietta was one of these trailblazers, and in Bingham's book, Irrepressible, The Jazz Age Life of Henrietta Bingham, she talks about how Henrietta bucked the tide of what was expected of a wealthy young woman in Kentucky at the turn of the 20th century. She was absolutely part of the elite, white, social, and sort of cultural elite of Louisville, Kentucky. She was expected to go to school, which girls were doing then, become a debutante and probably just grace society in Louisville, Kentucky and maybe do some good. None of Bingham's relatives wanted to talk about great Aunt Henrietta. She was beyond the black sheep of the family, so the writer had to do her own research. She found an old trunk that contained letters, photos, and other memorabilia and started pasting Henrietta's adventurous life together. As a child, Henrietta showed that she wasn't cut from the same cloth as other Southern socialites. I did notice that many pictures of her, almost all the pictures of her as a child, she wears this kind of tough and kind of intense look on her face. She liked to dress up. She especially liked to ride horses. She liked to dress up in cowboy clothes. And even though her father had two other children who were both male, she seems to have been encouraged by him to be as strong and athletic and, I don't know, ambitious, really, as she wanted to be. Bingham says that Henrietta's father was obsessed with Joan of Arc, and this could be why he encouraged his daughter to take chances in a society that really limited women's prospects. He even looked to her as his successor in his publishing empire. Despite her tomboy ways, Bingham says that Henrietta was irresistible to both men and women, and she had romantic liaisons with both during her life. Henrietta fit into circles both at home and abroad. She was a member of the famous British set The Bloomsbury Group, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Virginia Woolf and John Maynard Keynes. One of her admirers was the actor-producer John Houseman, star of the 1973 film and television show The Paper Chase and a longtime collaborator of Orson Welles. Bingham says Houseman came to New York and fell head over heels for Henrietta. He was a half-Jewish immigrant from England with parentage that wasn't really English. In the mid-20s, coming to the United States to be a grain trader to, you know, buy and sell vast quantities of American corn and wheat. And he fell in love with Henrietta, having also had his own intellectual side and aspirations. He'd met her briefly in London, but she was living in lower Manhattan in 1925. And she basically introduced this very young man, they were peers, they were in their mid-20s, to the Harlem Renaissance. And he fell in love with her, spent his first several years in America, obsessed with her. Bingham found a stack of letters from Houseman to Henrietta that recalled their outings, which were very uncharacteristic of a wealthy young woman in the 20s, such as Henrietta driving a car, going to Harlem jazz clubs and rent parties without a care who saw or talked about them. But Houseman wasn't Henrietta's big love. That was tennis star Helen Jacobs, and they did have a romance for a time. But coming up to the 1950s, same-sex relationships were dangerous. It came at a time in the 50s when many lesbian and gay people in the United States, very conscious of the homophobia that was associated with the McCarthy era, 
many gay and lesbian people actually lost their jobs if they were teachers or if they were working in the military or the federal government because it was thought on the federal government side, it was thought that they were a risk to be spies because if somebody found out the secret about them, they could blackmail them, right? So Henrietta took a long look at her life and decided it was safer to marry than to continue with her unconventional lifestyle. In 1954, she married Benjamin Franklin McKenzie, a man she'd known only briefly. The marriage broke up after only a few months, and she fell into a depression, suffered from anxiety, and for years her health continued to deteriorate. Doctors suggested that Henrietta undergo therapies that were on the cutting edge at the time, but nothing worked. She was put into treatment with psychiatrists who prescribed all kinds of dramatic things, including shock therapy and prefrontal lobotomies. We've read stories like this about that period in the 50s, especially when those procedures became very, very popular to treat all manner of things, whether it was depression or alcoholism or homosexuality. In 1968, Henrietta died of an internal hemorrhage and was buried next to her father in Louisville, Kentucky. Bingham says that Henrietta Bingham's life would have been very different if she had lived today. But even though she came to a bad end, she did pave the way for the more tolerant societal attitudes we enjoy now. I want people to understand that Henrietta is one of many, many figures in our past who are not famous, who didn't become president, who didn't invent a new technology, who didn't write the great American novel, and yet whose lives give us a window onto a rich, rich, and compelling and human experience. Our next pioneering woman had a life completely different from Henrietta Bingham's. Victoria Shore writes a fictional account of her in her new novel, Backlands. The woman's name is Maria Bonita, and she wasn't a socialite, but a bandit in Brazil in the 1920s and 30s. Maria Bonita became a bandit, not a girlfriend or a sidekick. She was a real member of the group. She learned to shoot really well. She was just as brave they had to be. After she joined the band, other women did too, and they were all brave people out there fighting for their way of life. And it was a fabulous life in a way. It was a passionate life. It was terribly dangerous, but it was also thrilling. Shore says that Maria and her band of mostly men didn't rob to get rich. They were more like Brazil's version of Robin Hood, taking only what they needed and trying not to hurt their victims. What they would do was when they would get to a village, if there were no police there, the police would often flee if they knew the bandits were coming. They would come into the town, talk to the mayor, find out who could give them how much without feeling it, as they said. Then they would spend the money in the town. They would buy supplies that they needed, like cloth and needles, things we don't think about. And then, once they'd supplied themselves, they would host a fabulous dance for the people. And I met plenty of people out there who'd been to these dances, and it was really the only dances that they ever had. Maria was a good horsewoman and an excellent shot and she and her associates were much feared by law enforcement at the time. You might think that having a woman as a full-fledged partner in a gang would make her ruthless and cruel. Shore says that, in fact, Maria had a softening effect on her male counterparts. When Maria Bonita joined the troupe, they stopped fighting so much. They would run when they could rather than engage, so there was much less killing. They still had their primacy and they lived their lives, but there was much less actual violence. It reduced the violence. One thing that impressed Shore about Maria was that she was a real leader, albeit a bandit. Women are making inroads these days, but she says they aren't in positions at the top in great numbers. Fostering leadership in women is a special interest of Shore's. That's why she helped found the Archer School for Girls in Los Angeles. She says that single-sex schools help girls focus on their studies without the distraction and sometimes intimidation that co-ed culture creates. You walk into a girl's school, and any girl's school, and you're in a girl empowerment zone. It is a different feeling. You're in a different place. The president of the class is obviously a girl, always a girl. The basketball team is the girls' team. It's not called the girls' team. It's the team. That is profoundly different. You go to a girls' school, mostly you wear a uniform that everybody else is wearing, and there you are with your friends, focused on math or science if you're smart. 
you don't have to pretend you're not smart. As so many girls say at Archer, when people ask them, why did you choose to go to Archer School? She said, because here I can be as smart as I want to be. Archer is a success. And now Shore, a graduate of Wellesley College, is focusing on building another girls' school on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. About two years ago, I read a few articles in the New York Times about Pine Ridge, where the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which is the poorest place in America, is actually poorer than Egypt. And I read that one in four babies is born with fetal alcohol syndrome, and that floored me. And I I realized that girls who go to girls' schools don't have babies with fetal alcohol syndrome. They are going to college. And then suddenly I thought, oh, no, I might have a credential having co-founded Archer School that I could put to use for these girls on the Pine Ridge. And what if we did start a girls' school there? What would happen, a college prep girls' school? Along with another advocate for Native American causes, Shore has started work on the school, and they hope to open this year. Like Bingham, Shore wants readers of her book to take note of the contributions that unconventional women have made to our world and take away a new appreciation of their courage and strength. These bandits were seeking justice. Their lives were very dangerous, but they were also really wonderful and really free. And they woke up every day excited with life, thrilled with life. And they watched the sun rise, they watched the sun set, they watched the stars rise. They had their dances, they had their love, they had their music. They lived a passionate life, and I think that's something that we can all tap into. You can read a fictional account of a real female bandit in Victoria Shore's novel, Backlands, available now. She also invites listeners to her website at victoriashore.com. For a look back at the life and loves of a truly unconventional woman, pick up Emily Bingham's book, Irrepressible, available in stores and online. You can log on to her website at emilybingham.net. For more information about all of our guests, visit our site at viewpointsonline.net. You can find archives of past programs there and on iTunes and Stitcher. Our show is written and produced by Pat Reuter. Our production directors are Sean Waldron, Reed Pence, and Nick Hofstra. I'm Marty Peterson. School shootings are every parent's worst nightmare. Since the Sandy Hook school shooting, there have been 132 cases of school gun violence. A new survey shows that nearly three-quarters of schools have stepped up security the last few years with cameras and safety drills. A new threat alert system called CopSync 911 takes protecting our children to a new level, according to CopSync CEO Ronald Wessner. By touching an icon on a classroom computer or smartphone, CopSync 911 can be activated by school staff. It sends an immediate alert to the five closest patrol officers and the local law enforcement dispatch center. A chat room opens so school faculty can talk to first responders in real time. It can be much faster than simply calling 911. A silent alert is also sent to all staff in the school. Everyone is responsible for ensuring the safety of students. Some states now even allow lawsuits against schools that are negligent about security. Find out more at copsync911.com. That's C-O-P-S-Y-N-C 911.com.